Welcome to T21 Mom. Welcome to the T21 Mom podcast, where we celebrate life's unexpected twists and turns. And this is episode 123. I'm Mary, mom to Ainsley, an 11 year old with Down syndrome and autism. And I am living life my way. Today, we have Shelly DeGroote sharing her inspiring diagnosis story of a surprise pregnancy after getting her tubes tied and how that little extra chromosome has brought so much joy and growth into her world. Let's go have a listen. Today on the T21 Mom podcast, we are continuing our series on diagnosis stories. I have been chatting with lots of moms and the stories are all so varied. It's really, truly wonderful. Today, I'm sh- chatting with Shelly DeGroote. Welcome, Shelly. Hi, thank you, Mary. Thanks for having me today. You're very welcome. So before we kind of get started on your diagnosis story, do you want to share a little bit about you and your family? Sure. We are from Southwest Minnesota, very rural farming community. My husband is a farmer. Okay. And we have four children. Connor is our youngest and he has Down syndrome and he was later diagnosed with autism as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Our other three children are a little bit older. They're all adults. They're married and they all have children. So Connor is an uncle to four nieces and nephews as well. Oh, fantastic. And how old is Connor now? Connor is 18 now. Okay. And my daughter also has the dual diagnosis. How old was Connor when he got that secondary diagnosis? Officially, he was like seven. I had been suspecting it earlier, but yeah. Yeah, that's often had the to, case. Had to kind of push for testing and this kind of stuff. And yeah. Yes, I, I've i heard that a lot, especially with kids that are kind of more like Connor's age and a little bit older. I think maybe ne- like my daughter's 11, but I'm thinking now it's starting to become more recognized that there is the possibility Mm -hmm. that, you know, because it's actually fairly common, it's almost 20% of our kids have that dual diagnosis. So yeah, I think it's about 18, 18 to 19%. I mean, it obviously depends on what studies you're looking at, but for the most part, what I've heard is around that, which is, you know, pretty high, much higher than the typical population. So, and that's a whole journey in itself, the whole (laughs) autism diagnosis, as I'm sure you know. Yes. As you said, Connor is your last child and he's obviously rocking a little bit extra. And he definitely had you on your toes from day one. Do you want to share that story that you shared with me? Sure. So having had our other three children when I was in, well, we, Lauren and I are the same age. We're in our 20s and early 30s. We had decided that our family was complete and that, you know, we didn't want to be one of these people having this later on pregnancy thing happen. So we, I kind of thought he could have a vasectomy. He didn't want to. So I'm like, okay, I'll have my tubes tied. And I went to this OBGYN specialist that had an opening and I didn't really know him. And I had asked a few questions and he had said, now make sure that you really want to do this because you can't just assume it would be reversible or whatever. You know, he asked me several times, are you, you know, sure this is what you want to do? Your family is complete. And I said, yes. And okay. So we had the procedure. And so fast forward a couple of years later, I all of a sudden started feeling pregnant, having had <laughs> three before. And I I bought a test. I took it and it was positive. And I was I was just in disbelief, but yet I, I I knew what my body felt like, right? Mm-hmm. And I called my best friend. My husband had ironically just left on a work slash mission trip that day. And so I called my best friend and I was like all shook up and she's like, Shelly, take another test. It can't be, you know? <laughs> so a total of four tests were taken over the lap, over that weekend. And by Monday morning, I called the clinic and uh, they said, you need to come in. Um, so I came in, they did a test, came back positive, And then they wanted to do an ultrasound because they said, having had my tubes tied, put me at a lot, lot bigger chance of having a tubal pregnancy, which they needed to find out. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. But 
there he was, or there the baby was, right mm -hmm. in the uterus where it was supposed to be. And um, so I was like, oh my goodness, this is happening. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I, uh, it was quite a shock to say the least, but I, I mean, once I got used to the idea, I, I was a little bit excited, like, okay, God is giving me one more chance to, mm -hmm. you know, be pregnant and have a baby and whatever. But I was 39 and a half when this was happening here. So, um, yeah. Wow. So what were you thinking, like, before test, well, fifth, when you go to the clinic? Yeah. Like, were you thinking this can't be happening or like, did you ever call that doctor back and let them know mm, didn't work? Like what was going through your head? Because usually, you know, when you're going to those extremes, you know, to either have a vasectomy or in your case, your tubes tied, those are generally pretty permanent. Although I right. have heard of a number of cases, not a number, but when I was posting about like asking for the diagnosis stories, I actually heard a few similar to yours, like, where the vasectomies didn't work. So, you know, I guess nothing is really a for sure thing. But what were you thinking when you learned that you're pregnant? And, you know, you weren't expecting this at all. You thought you were done. Well, my very first, I had, I had several thoughts. I'm kind of a, an anxious type of worrisome person by nature. And I first thought, is my husband going to be very upset? You know, is he going to be, a, you know, which he's, pretty calm, laid back guy. So I don't know why I worried about that, but I don't know. And then I was afraid that my teenagers would be embarrassed, mm. frankly, like, mm -hmm. you know, what else, you know, here's my, our old mom having a baby, you know, or whatever, but <laughs> they didn't seem too upset by it. And I, I don't think it took me too long to adjust to the idea of having a baby again, but I think it was more so I was, well, when he was born with Down syndrome, that was when I was upset, you mm -hmm. know, if if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but. Wow. Yeah. Because you've got kind of like almost like two double whammies for this. Right. You know, like right. he's an unexpected baby. And then, of course, you get the unexpected diagnosis, which we'll get into it briefly. So right. While we were chatting back and forth, you mentioned that you were, quote, nervous about Down syndrome. Why was that? I mean, you're 39 and a half, but to be honest, right now, that's not that uncommon these days for people to be having babies. So, you know, what what made you nervous about it? Oh, just, I guess, some of the people I knew that had Down syndrome seemed to have older mothers. Yeah, I don't know. I, I was, I would, I would try to pacify the worry by like looking up statistics, right? And, you know, I, I don't recall right offhand, but I think by age 39, when, which I was when I had him, you know, maybe the chances were like one in 120 or one, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember, 140. And I remember telling myself, you know, well, look, that's, you know, over 99% chance I won't, you know, have a baby with mm -hmm. nothing. So I tried to pacify myself like that. But, and ironically, when I, after that day, when they did the ultrasound and said he was in my uterus, then uh, my doctor wasn't available that day. And so they said, we want you to see your doctor, you know, and they made up an, made an appointment for like five, four days later. And as I walked into the clinic area with the nurse, this elderly couple with a daughter with quite a severe disability was walking into a different office at the same time. And I, my heart just kind of sank. And I thought, what if that would be me? You know, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I was fearful, fearful of it. So, mm -hmm. Do you think you kind of had like a sixth sense maybe that your child would be born with Down syndrome? I think so. But on the other hand, I kept telling myself it was just my anxiety and the nervousness of it. And that that God had a big plan for this child to be here because it was obviously against all what we had planned for and what we, you know. So I, I just kept kind of pacifying myself by saying, you know, 
God's got this, you know, God is in control of this pregnancy and this baby will be fine. And just that has good, you know, big plans for this child. So, yeah, I could see why you like that makes total sense why you would think that, because really against a lot of odds, you got right, pregnant. Right. I mean, yeah. So you would think, obviously, he was he's meant to be here now. You're nearing the end of your pregnancy and you came across a book that turns out to be a bit prophetic. Can you share a bit about that? Yes, I was feeling big and tired and old, right? The last month of my pregnancy. So I had found a book series from our church library and spent a lot of time just relaxing on the couch, you know, right? Putting my feet up and whatever and reading. And it was a author named Roxanne Henke. She was from North Dakota, kind of farm country. And she wrote her characters and her storylines were in North Dakota. And I could kind of relate to some of that. And anyway, there was a couple in the in the series that found out they were having a baby later in life, around age 40. And in that particular instance, it was different than my husband. Because the husband in the book was upset. He was not happy that this was happening or whatever. Um, but then all of a sudden I'm reading and the baby is being born, right? And then suddenly after the baby was born, instead of everybody in the room being all happy and elated and everything, Ms. Roxanne Henke was writing things about the hushed tones of the doctor and nurses. And then she went on to describe the baby, the characteristics. And she started saying, writing things like a very flat, bridge or a almond shaped eyes, hallmark trees in the hand, low set small ears. And right then I just I knew it. I thought this baby has Down syndrome. And I I honestly almost tossed the book across the room. I I like shut it and mm -hmm. put it aside and I thought, Shelly, this is this is not what you need to read right now. Mm -hmm. Is this just the devil trying to make you worry. You know, I had all these weird thoughts. But then later the curiosity got to me. I kind of had to know how the book ended. And uh, <laughs> I did finish the rest of the book. But yeah, that was that was interesting to me and how it ended up coming about in my life. Like it's almost like it was trying to prepare you, do you think? Oh, I, I definitely think that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Obviously, like it kind of really sounded like it kind of mirrored your life except in the book the husband wasn't very happy about it right. you know and then you know after reading it like I know you were still thinking okay it's like 99% chance it's fine but right did it kind of I guess increase your anxiety that this could happen to you mm -hmm. yeah if I want to yeah if I'm being honest yeah I'm sure I spent some some time awake during the night there worrying whether that would happen to me. I think the biggest connection about that book was that within the first five minutes of me holding Connor, I just knew it. I knew it from the description of the book. You know, I held, the nurses had been working on him in the little isolate thing or the warmer or whatever. Lauren was over there watching and I don't know, the doctor was tending to me. And they placed him in my arms and just like that, everybody left. The nurses left and the doctor was called away to a, another de delivery he needed to assist at right next door. And it was just Lauren and I and Lauren walked over by me and I looked down at Connor and right then he opened his eyes and looked up at me and I thought, are his eyes almond shaped? And then... I took his little hand and I opened it and I thought to myself, I don't see a crease there. Mm -hmm. And then I opened his other little hand and I thought, no, I, there's no crease there. And I kind of dismissed it. And then he shut his little eyes and I thought, he looks fine. He's, he's fine. He's just a big baby and he's kind of puffy because he was like 10 pounds. Wow. And he had this big round face, mm -hmm. which I now know is probably because of the low tone oh, or whatever, yeah. but. But then he had a little beanie on that those newborns have on, right? To mm -hmm. keep their heat in. And I lifted up the beanie a little bit and I looked at his ears or one, one of his ears and I thought, they're little, they're little and low set. 
And then he looked at me again. And then I looked at my husband and said, I think there's something wrong here. I, I think that's what I said. And he said, um, are you looking at his eyes? He said, I know. He had been watching when the nurses were working on him already, right? And if I felt then like my world just came crashing right there because my husband is super optimistic and laid back. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted him to say so badly was, oh, he's fine. Yeah. Tell you just word. He's fine. But he didn't, you know? So then I knew. I knew it wasn't just me making this up in my mind. I just, I just knew, which I think is okay. I think because we knew right away, we didn't have to have some stranger, some specialist come walking in and drop a bomb on us. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to discuss it with, you know, the, a nurse came in shortly after that and I said to her, we have some concerns about, do you think he has Down syndrome? And we told, you know, the reasons. And of course, being a nurse, she, she couldn't say much. She just said, I'll have the doctor come talk to you when he's finished. And then I think in the meanwhile, he, I don't know if they took Connor away to in the isolate, but then I think he had a chance to examine him a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then he came in and he just said, yeah, I, I see those same things that you do. And, you know, he kind of obviously couldn't say 100% without the chromosomal testing, but mm -hmm. he, he kind of confirmed. And so we knew, we knew. And, and that evening we, we told our families and that kind of thing too. But yeah, I had, a, well, there's one precious thing I, that I always will remember. My dad, he's been gone 12 years now, so. Connor only had him for six years, but when we told my dad, instead of him saying, oh, you know, or, or being sad, he said, we'll just have to love him all the more. And that was uh -huh. so precious. Just, I, I just cling to that. It's just so, so precious to have that response mm -hmm. from him. Oh, that's amazing. So, so yeah. you and your husband, like before anyone's even told you, you've pretty much are pretty much confirmed that he has Down syndrome. Like you mentioned that you have a strong faith. Like what was that like for you in that moment? Like you already have, sorry, three, three other kids, right? And right, right. what was going through your mind? Like I know for me, cause I'm a single mom by choice and my daughter's my only child. It's like, I mean, I have a partner now, but at the time I was, I was on my own. I, I thought, how am I going to do this? You know, right. What was your thoughts? Like, what were you feeling? What, and you and your husband during this time, right. it's, it's such a hard time, the diagnosis time. And you, and you've already figured it out before you've even actually got the diagnosis right. from a doctor, right. you know, right. it doesn't usually work that way. <laughs> Lauren is a very, like I said, laid back, optimistic person. So he kind of takes things as they come in life and just deals with it. Whereas I'm more of a thinker and an overthinker, I guess some people would say. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot, a lot of thoughts, right? Like I felt totally inadequate. I felt like my sister, I would tease her that she's the bold one of the family. She's the one that dares to tackle things and whatever. And I am the person who didn't even like to return things with a receipt because I felt like I was bothering somebody or whatever, right? And all these pamphlets I was giving at the, given at the hospital were talking about being an advocate and you needed to be an advocate for this child with Down syndrome. And mm -hmm. I felt so ill-equipped, but, and I was also, again, fearful that my children would be like embarrassed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to have your 39 year old mother having a baby, much less a baby with a disability like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but that was a very unwarranted fear. Uh, that was one of my greatest blessings has been seeing them love on Connor and also my husband seeing his patience with Connor and his just tenderness with him and you know Connor has taught us so much and and he's he's made me better mm -hmm. he's made me more patient mm -hmm. he's made me probably more loving and more stronger stronger than I ever thought I could be not saying it's been easy by mm -hmm. any means, especially puberty was 
<laughs> I mean, the teen years have been hard. Okay. So, not to freak you out, <laughs> but we had issues where he, for some reason, decided school, he didn't want to be there. And, you know, it was meetings and meetings and meetings and behavioral specialists. And eventually he ended up going to a an alternative school, like a Fed Four type facility for the last three semesters. And it it was, it's been a little bit rough, but at the same time, it probably bonded Lauren and I even more to, mm-hmm. you know, I had to come to the point where I, I really needed Lauren's help. And, you know, he, you know, probably like, I don't want to say liked that, but he probably needed that too, to be needed, you know, because yeah. Being a farmer, there's definitely time of the year where he's like really concentrating on farming. And I was more the parent role or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, t- that the hands on taking care of the kids and stuff. And, he, you know, he's had to step into that more with me. And we have had to kind of figure this stuff out as of, well, you know, the later years that have been more of a, you know, challenge, I guess we should, I could say. But mm-hmm. I mean, Thankfully, those challenges are, you know, they're not every day. They're not, all, you know, all day, every day. And I have to mm-hmm. remind myself that, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes out of a day doesn't, you know, mean that the whole day is <laughs> is bad or, mm-hmm. or whatever. But yeah, learned a lot from this little boy and uh, he touched a lot of lives. You know, mm-hmm. I look back and think, you know, I thought God had really great plans for this baby. And I really do think he did. He mm-hmm. And he does. Mm-hmm. They're just different than what I probably thought they were going to be. You know, mm-hmm. Connor is touching lives. I've had many people say, you know, how much they've learned from him when they've been working with him or, you know, how much they've touched, how much they've been touched by him. And yeah, Connor, he shakes all the people's hands in church when they leave church. That's become his new, his assignment. He he just goes out and does it. And he's loved by a lot of people. And I remind myself of that when, when on the hard days, it's Mm -hmm. like Connor is happy, Mm -hmm. mostly happy and he's loved. And isn't that what we're all wanting in life, you know, or striving for in many ways. So. Oh, that's so wonderful. And what is his relationship like with his siblings? Because they're a little bit older and like. Do they, would they advocate for him or, you know, because sometimes it can be a real challenge when you have your older siblings because, you know, like it's not cool or or what have you, right? right. And that, and it, that's a tough place to be when you have a sibling, I think, with some extra challenges and, and things like that. But what is his relationship like with his siblings? Very good. They, like when we were having some of the challenges with him at school, like big brother, he's the oldest. He was in on like a phone, like he was a part of the IEP meeting via phone, even though he lived four hours away. Mm-hmm. His sister, the one that's right above him, well, right above him, seven <laughs> years older. She is a special ed teacher and mm-hmm. she has come physically to meetings because she doesn't live quite as far away. She lives just like an hour away and given me like, you know, tips and different things like that. And they're all really, really good with him. Our other daughter is really good with details and money and that kind of thing. So we already have her down as, you know, somebody who would help with that kind of thing if if Lauren and I aren't here. And yeah, so that kind of thing. And and now that they're teaching their children to be accepting and loving of people with disabilities and You know, they're really, they're glad that their kids have that, have Uncle Connor in their lives Mm -hmm. to to teach them that. And Connor is really loving toward them. He, But he loves on them and then he goes and ciphers away because (laughs) I think the autism part of him needs to be be away sometimes. But Mm. but he really does really love them and they do, and they love him too. And the oldest one is four and she, she already knows that. Connor has, you know, special needs and she'll take him by the hand and come on, Connor, come with me. And she'll lead him over to, you know, that kind of thing. It's really precious. It's, it's really precious. And I didn't have, that was one worry I I didn't have to have is that they would be embarrassed or, and they're not resentful about, Mm -hmm. you know, time maybe that I had to give Connor when they were, you know, busy with 
teenage things and whatever, you know, I, I, we really tried our best, you know, but obviously, you know, Connor took up a certain amount of time and energy and, um, but oh, yeah. That's so wonderful to hear. I'm just curious, you said in the beginning that you're on a kind of rural, how was your access mm -hmm. to services for Connor? Like, was it challenging? Somewhat. I mean, yeah, his school system was small. Is well, was I guess he's finished his school now. Was small. I mean, I'm sure the school K through twelve is only like 350 students or something like that. It's relatively small, and it's about 15 minutes away, so not so far away. Um, but yeah, I guess because his diagnosis was late, and I didn't even know where to begin looking, like. I feel like we kind of missed that window maybe of like ABA, that kind of thing. And I don't know enough about it to know if it would have been helpful really or not in Connor's case. But he, hey, you know, he, he was able to have all the services, you know, the, you know, the OT, the PT, the speech, the, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, and I, like now he goes to music therapy, we bring him there and, but it's an hour drive one way to get mm -hmm. there yeah um but uh, he really enjoys that and i feel like you know we took our other kids to sport games and different things like that you know we can take connor to something like this that he enjoys and that it's it's good for him mm -hmm. but yeah you know i don't know if you feel this way as a mom of a child with special needs but i don't know if there's ever going to come a time where you think like i did everything that mm -hmm. i could have you know what i mean don't I don't know if mm -hmm. we, if that's the thing we feel that we always wonder, like, mm -hmm. you know, what if he talked better if I did this? What if he, you know, or do you get to a point where it's like, Connor is who Connor is and, mm -hmm. and it's fine, you know? Yeah. I think I, there's a mi mixture of those feelings sometimes. I think it's the mama guilt. I think it doesn't really ever go away. I, I have it huge because. <laughs> I mean, I feel bad that Ainsley doesn't have a sibling. So, you know, there's an awful lot of time spent on her iPad on the, on YouTube, which I would prefer not. But, you know, mm -hmm. I also have to get things done. I work full time. So, you know, it's not easy. But, you know, I think you just have to do the best that you can. And I think we're often our harshest critics, uh, us mamas. And, you know, I think we're all just trying to do the best for our kids because obviously we all we all want the best for our kids so it's it's hard some days some days are like you said like are just harder and you know can be frustrating or I just feel guilty I'm sure as you have like you know wish I could have done this that or the other but you know I think we're right. all I think we're all just you know doing the best that we can and we have to not be so hard on ourselves <laughs> Because it's, yeah, it's hard, right. you know, this is a different journey, uh, you know, and especially with a child with the dual diagnosis, you know, I find sometimes it's, it's very mm -hmm. isolating. It's I'm sure you probably found too. And it's, it's hard because I often think if she just had Down syndrome, this would be a lot easier, <laughs> but right, right. It's just the way it is. Right. And we just have to do the best that we can for our kids. Yeah. You know, right now. What, you know, you're 18 years in, so, you know, I'm always looking at the mamas who are ahead of me because you guys are literally are paving the road for us. And I thank <laughs> you mamas for that. But what advice would you give someone who has just found out their child has Down syndrome, either like prenatally or a birth diagnosis? Because we all know that sometimes that the way it's delivered, it can be quite brutal, you know, but what would you tell somebody? I would say that things are going to be much more okay than you that you might than you might think right now. I was quick to catastrophize and you know kind of spiral, and it was really hard for me to look into the future, hmm. and it was so scary and unknown. And I don't know if this is good advice or not, but it, I got pretty good at staying in the in the present, and I think because I had to because mm -hmm. the future was so overwhelming. And that worked for a long time um, until he was about 15. And then the, the people at school and such started, you know, pushing me to be thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've just gone through 
you know, guardianship process because yeah. at 18, we just, we, you know, we had to go through choosing which day program that he would attend, you know, just all those kind of things, touring those kind of things. And, mm -hmm. you know, so got kind of nudged out of my comfort zone of living in the present, but I would just encourage them to just do their best and mm -hmm. do it in love. And our families aren't as odd or, you know, unique maybe as what we, what we might be afraid of, mm -hmm. but, and that you're stronger than you think you are. And, and if you do it with love and, you know, focus on that, that, that is very helpful too, I think. And uh, yeah, but it's, 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 yeah, it's can be a challenge as well, but I do. So, um, I understand the, the scared part of it and the, of course. Um, yeah. The, Cause it was, it was an adjustment for me. I, I went through a lot, a lot of different emotions of mm -hmm. fear, anger, overwhelm, all that kind of thing. And I think we've all been there. <laughs> I think we all can relate in that way, right? Because we've all had the diagnosis and we all remember that moment, you know, and, yeah. and it's really unfortunate. I mean, I think doctors are starting to get better at it, but if they maybe thought about when they're telling somebody this, like new parents, how they're saying it, that the impact that it's going to have, because you don't ever forget that moment. You'll never forget that doctor. You'll never forget that phone call or however it was given to you. And I don't think a lot of them realize that, that it's, you know, it, yes, it's not necessarily news that we were expecting or wanting, but it's still our child. And, you know, how you deliver that and, and how you frame it can make a huge, huge difference for that parent. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I, like you, yeah, I had a lot of grief and devastation and it's hard. You know, it's like you said, it's, you know, it wasn't something you're necessarily expecting, even though maybe you had a sixth sense of it and <laughs> you just, you know, but I like how you said, you know, do it with love. Like, I think like love conquers all, right? And you know, that's, and our kids are just, I think for me, I feel they kind of just exude love and forgiveness and acceptance, you know, they're, oh. you know, they just have that sense about them that I think we can all learn from, you know, that totally these, they, they're special in so many ways, not just with an extra chromosome. And what would you, you know, if you could go back, is there anything that you would maybe change or do differently? Well, people have asked me, like, you know, what have you liked to have known ahead of time? What have you, do you wish you would have done more testing? Would, do you wish, you know, whatever. I think my situation played out the way it was supposed to. I think knowing myself and how I would have completely catastrophized and gone down a whole rabbit hole of I, I would have been I would have been convinced he would have been needing surgeries and needing this and you know would I, I would have just probably been super just the whole like way more than what I was with the whole pregnancy. So I think I was meant to be holding him in my arms and and feeling that bond and love already before and so I think it, it went the way it was supposed to now maybe could have I pre you know prepared my mind a little bit for it if I would have known before yeah maybe but I guess that's not the way it, it happened and uh, it's mm -hmm. all it's okay it's, so obviously in your case it was better to have a birth diagnosis as opposed to a prenatal diagnosis I think so but I do appreciate the fact that Lauren and I kind of did figure it out from the help of that author right off the bat. And that, yeah, I think that was, you know, somewhat helpful. So. Yeah. It was all, I think kind of just sort of meant to be the way like you got that book and when you read it, yep. and it was all just mm -hmm. kind of meant to happen that way. Yeah. I know I would not have done well with a birth diagnosis. I was very happy to have a prenatal diagnosis and it. And oh, what cool. I find is most people, however they receive the diagnosis is the way they prefer. 
Yeah, oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's been very interesting to whenever I ask anybody that they've all, I ha- I don't think I've had one person say that they wish they got it the other way. So, which okay. I find is quite interesting. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe I would have been okay with a birth diagnosis. I don't think so, but you know, never know. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Oh, that's so wonderful. Well, thank you, Shelley, so much for coming on today and, you know, sharing your story about Connor and, you know, about that book that was sort of kind of gave you a sixth sense into what was coming. And I really appreciate you sharing your story with me today. Well, and I appreciate the work you're doing on being there for moms with kids with Down syndrome. So thank you. Oh, thank you. You're, yeah, no, I really love doing the podcast and it gives me a lot of joy. And I love meeting other moms like you who, you know, who can share their story because I love to hear other people's stories and they're all so different, which I'm finding just so amazing and, and wonderful. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Can you imagine finding out you're pregnant after thinking your family is complete and you even have your tubes tied? I think Shelley's story is incredible how she not only came to grips that she was unexpectedly pregnant, but then later finds out that her son has an extra chromosome. That's a lot to take in. But I love how she said her son has made her better. I know I feel the same way about Ainsley, and I'm sure a lot of us can say the same about our kids who are rocking a little bit extra. And also how her son has made her stronger than she ever thought she could be. And she also gave such sage advice to stay in the present. So often, I know I do it, we can get caught up worrying about the future when we really should just be more focused on the now. And also that you are stronger than you think. If you would like to share your diagnosis story, I would love to hear from you. You can contact me at my website, t21mom.com. You can send me a message there, or you can even leave me a little voicemail and I'll be sure to get back to you. I really hope that you're enjoying these diagnosis stories as much as I have. It's been really wonderful talking to all these different moms and and hearing their story and like i've said we all have a story to share so keep on loving when you're rocking kiddies